This is Ichari Bachode, an Okinawan Voices and Stories podcast, episode eight. Hi, Ty, and welcome. We're so excited to kick off our second season, um, and we are starting with an interview of our very first Kickstarter backer, Momi Cummings. Uh, so welcome, Momi, um, and do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, your pronouns, and perhaps what land you live on as we get started here? Hi, Ty, everyone. This is Momi Cummings. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and I am Shimanchu Oivi and Pinai, and I live on my ancestral Native Hawaiian homelands. Awesome. And then I guess uh, connected to like the Okinawan and Ryukyu side, um, mm-hmm. do you know where your ancestral hometown is? So I'm actually looking at the Picture Bride stories by Barbara Kawakami that my uh-huh. father is featured in. So oh my thank goodness. this book for telling me that her home village is Misatomura Nakagumiken. Oh my god, that's like awesome that you have that resource. And yeah, could you repeat the uh, the name of the book again? This is Picture Bride Stories by Bar- Barbara Kawakami. Definitely put it in the the links and um, the show notes. Great. So um, yeah, it sounds like you are a blend of so many things. But what inspires you about being Okinawan, Rukyuan, or Shimanchu? Um. I actually love being multi-ethnic Shimanchu because I feel like I have always felt really embraced and supported in Shimanchu community being a mixed race person. Um, and I am super inspired to be able to connect with you folks in community virtually over the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, meeting other Shimanchu in the diaspora. I have a super huge passion for family history research so I'd love to talk about that um, and being able to just collect our ancestor stories and genealogy to be able to pass on to the next generations. That's an amazing answer um, and a great segue into our next question which is what do you do in life? Um, what is your passion? What do you study? Um, whether it's art or education? I know you're involved in so much. Yeah. So I work as a teacher um, at a school for Native Hawaiians called Kamehameha on Oahu, where I live. Um, And I teach economics. So my passion is making economics and finance accessible um, to my home community and to Indigenous communities in general. Um, I'm also passionate about, like I said, family history and genealogy research. So I am really loving and inspired by learning not only about our like collective Okinawan history, but like our specific family histories Mm. and all the stories of resilience and creativity and migration. Those inspire me a lot. Wow. I love that. Um, But what is your dream or hope for Okinawa or the UQs? Mm. So one, my personal dream is actually to be able to reconnect um, with our homeland. I've never been to Okinawa mm. and actually no one in my direct lineage has been back since my baba left in 1911. Oh, so wow. it's been over a hundred years wow. um, since my mom or grandma or baba, who's actually my great grandma, has been back in person. Mm. Um, I had a trip planned for March 2020, and we know that that <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> uh, and then I had another trip planned for March 2022, and that's not going to happen yet. So I'm really hopeful for Taifai 2022, um, or whenever is going to be the soonest safe time to be mm-hmm. able to, to visit. Um, and one of the things that I'm inspired by is the... Um, resistance to militarization that's happening both in Okinawa and here in Hawaii. I think that's a really um, heartfelt connection that I can relate to from my lived experience growing up here in Hawaii um, that's also super pertinent to our homeland. Mood shift, but what is your favorite Okinawan culinary dish? (laughs) (laughs) I know this is probably going to be a very basic answer, but andagi. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> and I have, I have reasons. So um, <laughs> I'm so happy to be able to connect with fellow Shimanchu on Instagram. I just met my friend Yuki on, who I met on Instagram. And she made me andagi the first time oh, that we met. It was oh. so sweet. 
Ooh, yeah. And I had to tell my mom, like, mom, I made a friend. And she was so happy um, <laughs> because my auntie, who is my grandma's oldest sister, um, she was like the family and also hometown on the game maker. Oh, and uh, she had like, this flick of the wrist. So she was known for being able to um, dispense the dough by hand. Yeah, that's hard. This, like, specific flick of the wrist. And oh, she didn't goodness. ever have to use like a spoon or scooper or anything. Oh. And it's just this like little, you know, anti-magic that we <laughs> yeah. enjoy and that makes us feel like home and special. So yeah, it was beautiful to be able to make a friend virtually and then in real life and have that connection. Yay. Oh my gosh. And to share food. That's yeah. so, like and that's like that's like a true Icheri Bachode. Like you met yeah. online yeah. and then you met in real life and you shared a meal and it's like you're bonded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Um, could you share with us the one person who has influenced your life the most? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I for this podcast and in my life, I have to say my grandma, my grandma Nancy, she was born Shigeko Nakasone. Her second grade teacher gave her the name Nancy because she didn't want to have to say the name Shigeko. And that name stuck with my grandma for the rest of her life. She second generation Uchinanchu, um, born in the 20s. So she lived through the Great Depression. She came up um, in the 40s. So she was coming of age during wartime. And she was the first person in our whole family to graduate from college. Mm. She actually worked for over 12 years to put herself through school um, and then graduated with a business degree in 1954. Um, and so as, you know, an Okinawan American woman by herself, you know, she actually left Hawaii and went to Colorado to get that degree, oh. that tenacity and just, you know, the fierceness of that attitude shapes me. Um, and then with that, she instilled in me and the rest of my family, um, the importance of giving back. So she was a school teacher and specifically a special education public school teacher in Hawaii for over 30 years. Um, and just really took it upon herself to do whatever she could, wherever she could. Mm -hmm. So when we were little, she used to take us to the back roads of Kauai and she got adopt the highway t-shirts from the Goodwill oh my and self-appointed herself and us my young cousins and I um, adopt the highway of that road. And oh. every weekend we would just go and clean that road. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's amazing. Completely <laughs> unconnected to any like official organization. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned from her and what I think is very to me, the Shimanchu spirit is mm. when you want to do something, when you know that is right, or like when you see a need in your community, you just do it. You find a way you be creative and do it with a light and happy heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love that so much. Yeah. That's incredible. What a legacy. Mm -hmm. what has. Can you say her name one more time? I want to just honor it. <laughs> yeah. Nancy Shigeko Nakasone Blaylock. A little bit of a transition. Is there anything uh -huh. that you would like to share with us that we may have not asked that would be important for us to know or our listeners to know about you? I would love to take this opportunity to put it out there that if there are any other Shimanji, especially in diaspora, who have a passion or interest for collecting family history, family stories, or trying to document your genealogy, I would love to connect. I would love to be able to share resources. I have a passion for this, and I found it particularly challenging um, because I only speak English mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. access historical resources specifically related to genealogy. So I've only been able to go back to my Baban's generation. Mm. Um, and I know, you know, the, the beautiful multitude of languages that we speak in our Shimanchu diaspora is both a blessing that we can, you know, access so many different worldviews. And it's also such a challenge because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, how do we connect and share our resources across diaspora so that is my 
passion and my current undertaking. Um, and if anybody else is on the same wavelength, I would love to be able to like collect resources for our our shared benefit. Yeah. <laughs> and our, our oh ongoing, gosh. you know, family history collection. Yeah. yeah. And then where can our listeners find you online? Um, my Instagram, which is not professional in any capacity, is <laughs> cool and mommy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's the best way to connect with me um, on Instagram. Thanks. Awesome. Great. We'll definitely have that in the show notes. Okay. Show notes. Um, and are there any shout outs that you would like to give while you have this space? Go for it. Yes. For it. Okay. First and <laughs> foremost, our podcast co-creator, Erica, thank you for making Shimanchu Pen Pals oh. my Shimanchu non-family friend list has grown 10 times. Oh, I'm so happy to hear. Yes. And specifically my queer and trans Shimanchu Pen Pal family. What's up? Hello. <laughs> um, I grew up thinking. I was the only one. I was the only one. But we are out of here. And so to my pen pals, I love you guys so much. Um, specifically my day ones. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not on Shimanchi Pen Pals, this is my plug on behalf of Shimanchi Pen Pals. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, I guess our final and most favorite question is your go-to karaoke song. We're going to add this to our playlist. I started a playlist on on Spotify and I'm adding to it and we're going to have our booth and everyone has their songs lined up to sing. So what is yours? I love this. Um, okay. First of all, find me on Instagram so that this can be an ongoing conversation. I regularly ask people for <laughs> karaoke recommendations and I'm compiling a playlist. So connect with me there. <laughs> um, I got to say Adele, make mm-hmm. you feel my yeah and it's song we're there we got to close out the night with it though so that everyone <laughs> good and we, we don't really care about being on pitch because <laughs> to the social connection and enjoyment of it all <laughs> i love it mm-hmm. a well-curated karaoke list does take into account the final song yes so, yeah um, you gotta know yeah. like what's the vibe right yeah like, yeah, you gotta like send off into the night. <laughs> so I'm good. <laughs> I'm 100% yes. behind that. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much, Momi. I super appreciate you, um, all of your support, your energy, your joy. Thank you again so much. It was so nice to be with you folks. Thank you for your time and your energy and for making this podcast that makes me cry every episode. <laughs> I love it. Yay. Well, thank you. We'll catch you again soon. Thank you. Hi, hi, and welcome to episode 8 of the Chariba Chode podcast. My name is Mariko, and today I'll be your co host alongside Erica Kunihisa. Hi, hi. This month's episode, we will be talking about activism in Okinawa, specifically around the relocation of the US military base to Hanako. As with many things relating to Okinawa, this topic is complex, and there are many sides to the sensitive issues that have direct relation and impact on many Okinawan lives. That being said, we want to begin this episode with a slight disclaimer that the views expressed in today's episode may be sensitive or contentious to some people. The podcast stands firm in our mission to provide an open and safe space for these challenging conversations inviting diverse voices to the table so that our diasporic communities might be informed and have the opportunity to hear and learn from each other. Our guests will share their individual viewpoints and if we're doing our job right, we'll engage in healthy and respectful discussion. Their viewpoints are their own and not reflective of past or future guests. 
Well, with that out of the way, I'd like to move to welcoming our amazing and honestly badass humans who will be joining us today as our guest speakers. So yeah. first, I'd like to welcome Maya. Hi, thanks for having me. And Kaya Yonamine. Hi, yeah, thanks for having us. Maya is a Yonsei Okinawan American and is currently an associate editor at The Intercept, but lives in New York. She previously worked at New York Magazine and The Nation, where she wrote two powerful articles, Okinawa in their fight to stop a new U.S. military base, Okinawans confront two colonizers, and in Okinawa, the U.S. military seeks a base built on the bones of the war dead. Kaya is a second-generation Okinawan American. Wishing to bring awareness to the mil U.S. military base relocation happening in Hinoko, not being covered by the media, Kaya traveled to Okinawa in the spring of 2019, where she created the documentary, Our Island's Treasure. The documentary centers on the destruction of the beautiful Okinawan ocean in Hinoko and the fight by the native Uchinanchu to protect it. She also has a website where you can see the completed documentary as well as resources for action. Kaya is a current journalism student enrolled in her second year at the University of Hawaii. Welcome, Kaya and Maya. This is a really exciting podcast episode. And yeah, again, just welcome to, um, to the podcast again. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're so excited. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. I know it's our first episode of this new 2002, no, 2022 yeah, new year. Ah. <laughs> Man, that'd be crazy if we went back to 2002. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, but it, so we are so welcome to this these two awesome activists into the podcast, but there are so many different other ways that activism shows up within our community and we're only scratching the sur surface of these topics. But um, just kind of to start everyone off into getting to know you two, um, how did you get started in your Shimanchu identity journey and what got you into journalism slash activism? Uh, maybe we can start with, uh, with Maya for this. Yeah. Hi. Thanks again for having me. I guess I got started um, learning about Shimanchu identity because my my grandmother is Okinawan. Um, she's Okinawan American. She was born here shortly after both of her parents uh, came from uh, they're from Nakijin and Kodijima, respectively. And I always learned um, growing up that we were sort of Japanese, but not really. And mm -hmm. uh, being Okinawan was a little bit different. It wasn't part of the mainland. The culture was a little bit distinct, but it wasn't really um, clear to me why. And when I was in, in high school and college, I started to get interested in colonialism and the, like the process of imperialism and colonization as a topic, um, mostly learning about Latin America and mm -hmm. the colonization of, of the American of the Americas here by, you know, the Spanish, the English, the Portuguese, et cetera. Um, then as I started reading a little bit more Okinawan history and talking to my my grandma, um, who actually wrote a book about her parents and their travels to the United States that contains a lot of Okinawan history within it, um, I realized that I was kind of encountering the same exact thing, um, or maybe not same exact is probably the wrong way to put it, but a very similar process. Um, and another example of imperialism. And it totally clarified for me why I'd always been told somewhat euphemistically, like, oh, we're sort of Japanese, but not really. Mm. Yeah. And what was the name of the title of the book that um, uh, she wrote? Yeah, it's called From Okinawa to the Americas. Um, oh, awesome. I can, yeah, we can put it in the, the show yeah. notes and stuff. It's by, my grandma's name is Akiko Yamagawa Hibit. And Amazing. Yeah, yeah we'll definitely have that in the show notes. Cause I, cool. I need to check that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really cool project. Um, she wrote it over the course of several years. She was interviewing her mother mostly um, who came to the United States via Peru. They came like immigrated to Peru, lived there for a while and were just trying to kind of, you know, make a life and then slowly traveled up through um, mm -hmm. South and Central America and Mexico, and eventually just like, you know, cross the river into the United yeah. States as so many people do. Um, oh. And and the reason my great grandparents left Okinawa was because of the Japanese um, kind of 
forced transformation of the economy and the changing communally owned lands to to private property that kind of impoverished a lot of people and and drove people out. So I just I got really interested in that story as I learned it. Um, and I had sort of separately become um, involved in journalism when I was in college and just sort of decided to pursue it as a career because I was excited about it. Um, and I don't really identify as an activist myself, but I, I like to write about um, activist movements and find that, you know, there's, there's just like so much there to tackle. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, Thank you for joining us. Yeah. What about you, Kaya? I feel like I'm about to tell my life story right now. So <laughs> um, how did I get started into Manchu identity? Um, I think from a very young age, because I'm second generation. So my mom was the one that was born and raised there, immigrated here and then had me in the States. So mm. I'm also the oldest and her first kid. So I'm the oldest daughter. So um, I think that played a part in learning those kind of stories as well as like she was a single parent for a while. So me and my little brother would just like pretty much mostly learned Chinanshu culture versus our other side, which I'm, I'm mixed, so Afro-Cuban side, but definitely knew a lot more about being the Chinanshu growing up. Um, mm-hmm. I would say from a very young age, um, not necessarily saying that we're Japanese at all. It was actually just like, no, you're the It's <laughs> like from, from the jump, we were indigenous. Yeah. This is not, you know, so that's kind of how she was raised also. Um, so I would say the legacy kind of goes far back for us. Um, awesome. My great grandpa was one of the DAs for Okinawan community and he was also one of the survivors of the war. So oh, wow. we stayed, her family, like she grew up in Naha in Sobe, but Another part of it is that um, my grandma's family is from Henza Island, which is a really, really small island. It's like 500 people, I want to say, like 90 percent elders, you know, like very culturally preserved. And so she kind of got that balance of like the city and also seeing like the ocean every single day kind of a mm-hmm. thing. So those are the kind of stories I got growing up was like the war time, um, knowing that you're indigenous, like this is what the ocean was like. This is what my grandparents would tell me, all those kind of things. And I think that had a big impact on my own identity and how I showed up in Portland, Oregon, which (laughs) is one of the whitest cities in America, (laughs) right? So it was interesting being a Chinansu or Shimansu, Afro-Cuban, living in like a really white city, but my specific neighborhood was like um, historically more culturally diverse. Um, But yeah, even from a young age, like I was part of our um, Japanese immersion program in Portland. And that was mainly because there wasn't a Uchinaguchi option. (laughs) And so my mom was like, yeah, my mom was like, well, you got to communicate with your family somehow. So I guess this is the best way we can do it. But yeah, so the whole goal for me to continue with that kind of education too, was to connect with my family in Mm -hmm. Uchinaguchi. Um, so I think, yeah, it really influenced a lot of decisions that I made in life. Um, I'm 19 uh, <laughs> and my first time going to Okinawa was my um, summer before freshman year of high school. And so being able to actually go and like see the places that she was talking about in her stories, you know, and like meeting the people definitely um, had a big influence on me. Um, I just wanted to give like a shout out to my great grandma too because she's or she just recently passed but she was 102 years old mm-hmm. and she was um yeah she was one of the teachers at the Hinayuri high school at the oh. nursing, the nurse high school yeah so mm-hmm. um oh. she always told stories to my mom also and then would pass those stories down about how like she never lost one of her students during the war and like those oh, kind of goodness. things so wow. I think it's definitely like yeah like those kind of direct impacts of like war mm-hmm. trauma but also like the beauty of being home and loving the ocean and their fruit and that. So yeah, it's kind of a mix of those deep stories and also just appreciating life kind of a thing. Yeah. That's a long answer, but um, no, I love uh, it. Yeah. And then activism, I agree with Maya. I don't really consider myself an activist. I feel like, I feel like you don't have to label yourself an activist either to be a part of those kind of things. Like even the smallest actions are being a part of a movement, you know? So Definitely with the Henoko movement, I've been wanting to get involved, but in Portland, there's so many other things as well. There's like the Black Lives Matter movement. There's, um, we did ethnic studies movement for a long time. Um, a lot of different things happening. So I would say I like to get involved in things, but I don't want to 
like label myself a certain way, you know? Mm. But yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your stories. And I just I'm so inspired hearing you both speak. Um, and I just love like how youthful um, you are, <laughs> um, Kaya, just like and just the joy that you bring, um, especially hearing the 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 intense sort of legacy that you have. I mean, that we all have. But just hearing your story, it makes me hopeful. Um, for the future, mm -hmm. um, for all of the generations, and that you're the eldest sister. So I, I'll probably ask some questions about that later. But um, I would love to move us on um, because there is a lot to cover today. Um, and again, with the limited amount of time, um, we do want to set a little bit of context for our listeners as we dive into our topic. Um, so wondering if you could both, and sort of in a dialogue, natural kind of way, give us a brief history or background um, on the U.S. military basis so that we can set the context for our listeners. So I guess this one can kind of start centuries ago, uh, but I think for the, the sake of time, we should probably start at around World War II. In terms of the U.S. military bases that currently operate, um, they exist because Japan, when, it, when Japan lost World War II, they gave up their right to have their own military. Um, and they entered what's called the Status of Forces Agreement, um, which basically says that the U.S. will defend Japan as an ally. And in exchange for that, Japan will provide most of the, the funding and logistical you know, kind of needs for these U.S. bases. Um, or I shouldn't say most of the U.S. does provide a, a lot of the equipment and, and whatnot, but, but Japan mm. pays substantially for them as well. Um, it's a little bit of a, an open and controversial question whether Japan actually does not have a military. Um, many people would argue that they do. It's called the self-defense forces, um, but it's just not supposed to be an offensive. Do you want to add some, something, Kaya? Yeah, I think I would. Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the military history itself. Um, I think a lot of the the impact that it's had on me is more emotionally, like how it feels to have so many bases. You know what I mean? Like, it's not right, right? Like just, it's how I feel about it because like, there's already so many bases, there's like 32 or more at this point um, that are US military that are in the islands. And I would bring up the statistics right now, but I feel like that's a lot, but just how small Okinawa is in relation to like, you know, colonial Japan land mass and everything is so disproportionate how many bases are on the islands. And it's actually very similar, I feel like, to a lot of other island nations. But um, I guess what I would add is like that emotional aspect of like when I talk to a lot of college students and high school students, like during the documentary process and afterwards, um, just that idea of normalizing military being around you all the time is something that really stuck out to me that... Mm -hmm. Like nobody even thought it was an issue until they left Ushina. And then once they left, they were like, oh, it's not normal to have like these soldiers around you every day and having that impact your lifestyle, I think. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I've always seen the military base like issue in general is like, there's so many of them. To me, it's an unnecessary amount, like totally unnecessary amount, but also how that is so normalized now for the younger generations that, um, it's war trauma, but it's also like generational trauma, like having it around you all the time, feeling like it's it's OK when it's not OK, you know, so that's yeah, that's a very um, good and like central point. I think I I think maybe just for people who don't know um, yeah. who are listening, we should note that, you know, Japan of uh, the U.S. has tons of military bases all over the world. Um and Japan has the most bases of any country in the world, um, the most U.S. bases. And Okinawa has 70 percent of those bases, even yeah. though it accounts for, I think it's 0.6 percent of the land mass. So it's less than one percent of the actual land. Um, and on the big island, 15 percent of that land is taken by U.S. bases. And these are all outposts that... Um, have popped up in the wake of World War II. The U.S. has just um, established more and more of these, occasionally closed or moved them, for the most part, just built it up. And yeah, they were originally like, the notion was that the U.S. was going to 
protect the people by um, establishing establishing these military bases in the immediate wake of the war. But of course, that process also involved putting people into concentration camps or internment camps. Um, and the Okinawa was actually um, administered by the United States for a while. It, it essentially took it from Japan like a war prize. Um, that was and, during the time of us use card, right? United yeah, yeah. States. I forget the acronyms already. But it's a <laughs> United States Civilian Administration. What is the R? Um, I, I should like, know this from our last episode. I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> we'll definitely have that in the show notes. Um, yeah. United States Civil Administration of the Ryukyu Islands. Yes, um, thank you. Was basically, a, it was a period of over 20 years after World War II um, when the United States had Okinawa as its own little colony. Um, and then when they they left, the agreement was that they would essentially be able to stay there into perpetuity with all these bases. Um, and it's just still going on now and they're building more. Yeah. And I guess to put it into f- more further context or from what I understand and what I've heard is like, um, Japan is basically the size of California, the state of California, and then thinking of that, and then Okinawa is like the size of Hawaii. And so to have all basically 70% of the U.S. bases on such a small island is kind of also how I think about it, which is really mind-blowing in a sense because of just, yeah, just the difference of landmass and also just, yeah, thinking of it in that perspective has also changed how I look at it too. Um, anyways, but so since World War II, there has been a lot of military bases popping up and um, there has been a lot of activism in the ok- larger Okinawan community there. And I think a lot of what I have heard and seen is it's a lot of the um, older generation who are constantly protesting the bases and I wonder if you could, if any one of you could um, elaborate a little more on that aspect of it. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of layers to that. There's so many different issues and conversations that get tied to the military base issue. I feel like, um, you know, even if we start with colonization in general, but um, definitely I've noticed that also, like when you're physically there for the protests, you do notice a lot more elderly communities that are there versus like younger generations of students, which I could be changing right now, but I'm not sure. But um, I think what I've noticed, at least for the most part, was a lot of those, like our elders are very much like directly connected to the idea of war and the direct impacts of war, either either living through it or having their relatives that directly live through it, you know? Um, I think that could potentially be a part of it, of um, when you're not being taught it at school, and you didn't experience it yourself, um, or at least not being taught to that extent of generational impacts, then you're not going to feel as connected to the problem as compared to somebody who lived through it, um, somebody who saw what these military bases are capable of doing um, and seeing it around you all the time. Um, So yeah, kind of bringing it back to like my previous answer of like, a lot of students um, felt like it's very normalized to have military bases around you until it's not. And then it's suddenly like, it's mind blowing. It's like, wow, this is actually a problem. Like this shouldn't be okay. But um, until you get to that realization, there's not like a guiding hand, like within the education system or within like a direct source other than your own relatives and your elders that are gonna be able to tell you like, this is what's happened. You know what I mean? that's kind of how I've seen things. I, I definitely know that students care. Like they know that this kind of thing is happening. It's just the extent of knowledge and the personal connection to it also, I think is a part of it. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to add to that also. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, first I, I agree that that's also the impression that I've gotten um, that it is largely an elder led movement because it's, you know, front of mind for the people who have actually experienced the trauma of war. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, that is that's concerning for the the fate of the activist movement, because as those people age and die out, you know, it's it's 
going to be a, a project to make sure those ideas are carried on. And what you said about like how there's so much that that's not taught in schools, um, I think is a really important point because it's appears to me. And, and I mean, this is, I'm an outside observer at this point. Like I, I've been to Okinawa one time. Um, I, I didn't grow up there. I didn't go to school there, but everything that I've learned from, from people I've spoken to is that there is very little actual Okinawan history in, in most Okinawan schools, because, you know, the, the textbook comes from the Japanese central government and there's been a long running process of erasure of, of the culture, um, intentional erasure, um, in the way that a lot of colonizing forces seek to kind of eliminate a sense of indigenous identity because it might give rise to a resistance movement. And um, a large part of that is covering up the fact that Japan concentrated its military in Okinawa in World War II in order to attract violence there rather than on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And as a result, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the civilian population was killed, um, largely at the hands of Japanese soldiers. And, you know, it's it, it makes sense that the Japanese government wouldn't want to push uh, push that narrative in schools, just like in a lot of U.S. public schools. We don't learn as much as we should about mm-hmm. the colonization of the United States by um, white settlers who killed indigenous people and the mm-hmm. enslavement of of people. Um, and there's also the fact that there are a lot of people who now have employment on the basis and that those, mm-hmm. you know, those people's experiences are are valid and, and real and they might not view the, the base as a problem um, because that's where they get their paycheck or because they have friends who, who work there. Um, you know, when you have so many military installations, you get these communities that that grow around them and it becomes very entangled. And even if it's evidence of of an imperial project, it's also for a lot of people, it's just their lives. And they not everybody thinks about their day-to-day life through that lens. Yeah, that's really um like a, a, a almost kind of like a nice segue to like the next question that we had here, but just the idea um, and the evolution of colonialism and how that relates to um, like and things like environmental racism or um, sort of tangentially from that, like the unsustainability of the bases and how that impacts the people um, in Okinawa currently. So I'd love to hear um, if anybody has any thoughts on those particular things. I know there's a whole slew of, of ways that that shows up, but um, I would be curious to hear your experiences or your thoughts. There's so many things I could say about this. I'm trying to think of one. Um, like, <laughs> you know, like environmental racism also specifically in terms of indigenous communities, whole other level of conversation. You know what I mean? Like even origin stories and the legends of our ancestors and like all those different things evolve around the island and around the ocean and around like our environment right like being for a lot of indigenous island communities like being connected with your island and your nature and your ocean is that's life like that is so important to you and that's the same i think with with chinanchu communities and shimanchu communities of like just being connected especially to the ocean i feel like is talked about a lot Mm -hmm. um which is why i i take henokal so personally as well as just the notion of the ocean being used in that way. Um, specifically back to environmental racism though, also the idea that like it can be seen or devalued in that way by a colonizing group. You know what I mean? Like without the consent of the people who this is their sacred land um, is kind of how I see it. Um, of course, outside of environmental racism, there's of course like already the history as we were talking about of colonization of Japanese like government and like community in general saying that you are not which not you're not Shimanchu at all you are Japanese you are going to follow our rules our cultural guidelines you're going to assimilate to us and then having no choice against that in an education system that punishes you for it right mm-hmm. so there's so many different layers to it I feel like but just the idea that 
Like for us, <laughs> for yeah. us, like this is our identity. This is our original identity because it's our lands and our islands and our ocean. And then the idea of that getting like purposely either taken away from you or damaged in some way is also damaging your connection to that is kind of how I saw it. But um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really like beautifully put point. Um, in an indigenous context, environmental racism, um, I think is, is most clearly seen when you have the, the fallout from the colonizers project, um, mm-hmm. contaminating the land and the water and, and harming the people who live there. Right. And so with the U S bases in Okinawa, there have been, um, many cases where, uh, they use chemicals called like PFAS or PFOS. Um, it's this firefighting foam um, that gets used in U.S. military training, um, and it's it's carcinogenic, and it can leak into the groundwater. Um, it can spill into it, it, it can contaminate like irrigation, and so on. Several occasions, there have been reports of these chemicals contaminating pe- local people's water. Um, there have also been fuel pipelines that are shown to have leaks and various flaws that can, again, contaminate the water and, and harm people. Um, there are there have been helicopter and plane crashes where they were doing a test flight and, you know, it, it hit somebody. Um, and I think and and there is where you get the environmental racism sort of bleeding into what maybe wouldn't maybe people wouldn't call it environmental racism, but just like human on human harm so Mm -hmm. in addition to the helicopter and plane crashes there have been many so i don't have an exact number but there have been several accounts of u.s marines um going off base and drunk driving and hurting somebody um also a lot of violence against women and children Mm -hmm. and you know it's just it's this notion that one this the superpower that's occupying wants to achieve their project of having all these military bases for their war machine. And as a result, the people who already lived there are just kind of collateral. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was also thinking too, like, like how you were bringing up those examples that this isn't just like, it's happening in, in Okinawa and everything, but it's also like a pattern across Mm -hmm. the world. Like it's not just a one-time thing. And so I think that's also part of the reason why it's, we're considering it in this like systemic way because it is systemic mm-hmm. and it is repetitive. Like it's not just us, I guess, but yeah, those are great examples. And then like okay. connecting it to other places that the same thing is happening right now too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And those places I'm, I'm assuming are you talking about like Hawaii right now with Red Hill and yeah. in Guam and stuff yeah. similar and stuff like that. I think what's interesting, yeah, thank you for bringing up all this too. I think another thing that kind of goes back in terms of like why the older generation, or we see a lot of the older generation being on the front lines of these activist movements is also going back to the wartime and going back to that um, phrase, Michidu Takara, yeah, thank you, (laughs) which is like life is precious, right? And so the idea that the land is precious, like, life itself in the land the water the people the culture and it's just like this common thread that in terms of like we're fighting for our life type of thing and i don't know where i was going with that but it's just kind of something that i um it reminded me of and i won't just like well we're sort of tangenting like i love the the idea of how precious the ocean is to um like i spent um my younger years in okinawa um and i was there in 1996 like i lived on base when there was that horrible um there was the rape incident um and so like my father was in the military and so i was like basically three years around that um going to okinawa in public school um and so i very much um internalize what you were saying, um, Kaya, about not realizing until you're outside of the context. And so I think a lot of my journey has been unpacking um, what I experienced in my youth um, and then being outside of that. So my dad did 22 years in the military and then 
um, from that, like going to college and then kind of unpacking what that, like what I grew up in, like, you know, and, you know, my mother being Okinawan, but also married to a U.S. military and like all of those things. But um, I don't know why I tangented to that, because really what I wanted to say was that Okinawan graves face the ocean. <laughs> um, and I think that that is like such a beautiful beautiful part of our culture. And um, yeah, when I was thinking about um, sort of the environmental racism and then the fallout, what, yeah, just imagining a world where our ancestors would be looking out at an ocean that isn't beautiful, you know, like the idea of Mirai Kanai, like the the life, the afterlife beyond across the ocean. Um, and if we aren't fighting to protect that, then, then what? Um, yeah. So anyhow, forgive my tangents, but <laughs> no, thank you for sharing yeah, it's a great that tangent. <laughs> Very illustrative of what we've been talking about. So kind of like continuing on in terms of like, um, different activist movements. Um, can you explain what the Henoko project is and, uh, where do we currently stand with that? I mean, I think this actually fits very nicely into the question of, you know, what is, what if the ocean weren't beautiful anymore? Basically to give a, a little bit of context back to the, the 1996 um, rape incident that, that Mariko was just discussing when that occurred, um, there was a huge outrage in uh, across Okinawa. Um, and as a result, the, the prime minister at the time, um, and the U.S. president at the time, uh, I think it was Ryotaro Hashimoto and the Japanese prime minister and Bill Clinton um, agreed that they would, quote, reduce the burden on Okinawa and they were going to close the Futenma air base, um, even though the soldiers who committed the crime were not based at Futenma. But they they decided they would close the Futenma air base, which has had some of these um, plane crashes and, and other you know, issues that we've been talking about and is in Ginoan, which is a very populous city. Um, it's a very busy area. But of course, they couldn't simply close the base. They had to replace it. Um, and as we've been discussing, like there's nowhere to put another base. And so they decided that they would artificially extend the land off the coast of Hinoko, um, it, which is in the north in a pretty remote fishing district the population is 1700 people um very small and uh camp schwab is already up there so rather than actually put another base on the land they are going to put landfill into the ocean expand the natural land mass and then put an airfield and all these other um like a, a loading zone and and construct this military base there um but the bay, Oda Bay, is incredibly biodiverse, and they're, you know, in the process of doing this, just going to kill so many um, animals and, and species. Um, I'm sure Kaya has lots to add. <laughs> yeah, I could add. I could add some of like the stats and things if that helps. Um, as we were saying earlier, with like the like keeping in mind the percentage of military bases in Okinawa already, right? Um, so this this new base supposedly new really like you know all that complicated stuff um <laughs> so the size of the base that they were trying to create on top of the coral reef system in that ocean which i'll talk about also um is supposed to be 205 hectares long or that's 383 football fields so if you oh. think about that context of oh. how much ocean and how much of the coral reef system is going to be taken up um that specific area also um not a coincidence that the Henoko region is also one of the poorest districts in the island. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's that internal struggle, like job security and things like that happening too. But besides the point, um, that region is home of one of, is the biggest blue coral colony, a uh, reef colony in the world. And that region is also, it's supposed to be protected by UNESCO, I think. Don't, I, I wouldn't quote me on that one. Maybe take that out. But <laughs> unless I research it. Um, but I sure. do know that that area is the second most biodiverse region in the entire world. And it's only second to the Great Barrier Reef. And so wow. to give you 
numbers for that. Um, there are over 5,300 marine species that live in just that region. Um, and over 262 of those are endangered. And that includes our own dugong, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a big conversation about how are you going to do this when you're, you're going into a place that should be protected and there's so many precious animals and lifestyle here. And this is a fishing community. Like this is mm -hmm. how people live, mm -hmm. but you're taking that. So 383 football fields, 262 endangered species, over 5,300 something species in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are those statistics, but also just the idea that the concrete is going to be put on top of the coral reefs and how much that will impact the region, even from an environmental point of mm. view, I think is really important. Um, that was one of the biggest things I think that hit for a lot of people when I would talk to them about Henoko also, even if you are involved in the military issue or, you know, some people see it as too political and all those kind of things. But if you see it from a we're destroying the earth type of perspective and then bring that into that this is our indigenous ocean and mm -hmm. this is our way of living sort of perspective. Um, it really heightens things for a lot of people of the severity of the issue. Um, so I think those are the, the biggest points that I wanted to make is not only how many bases are already there, right? And then the region that's being taken advantage of, but then also what's already there is already precious. Like it should not be taken away from anybody. Um, so I think that was kind of what I wanted to bring up like that recurring military bases, but then if you bring in the environmental part, it's like, it's crazy. <laughs> it's really crazy. Um, but yeah, the they're taking a really long time on the construction too, I wanted to say. Um, Maya's amazing articles also <laughs> cover some of these things too. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at like the articles that are put out there about Henoko, um, the way that they describe the ocean floor is as if it's like a mayonnaise consistency. Um, and that's because like everything that's broken down from the reefs and everything, it all stays there. And that's where the dugong go to, to feed, right? Like that's like mm -hmm. the region you go to. Um, and so all of the concrete and everything that they're dropping in, in the sand is all like just sinking in. And so they're just continuing to drop things over and over again all the time. Um, and then I know I'm going on for a while, but. No, we love um, it. Keep on going. This is good. <laughs> No, one of the things that I think is also very like ironic in a way when I was there for the first time, at least, and continuing to go, um, they're using dirt that's from our own mountains. That's it's red dirt um, and they're using it to also do the landfill. And so if you ever went, this is what you would imagine, like if you went there is that there's Camp Schwab, as Maya was mentioning, the, the entrance of the camp. And then there's like hundreds and hundreds, like all the way down, you can't see where it ends of concrete trucks, of bulldozers, of trucks with red dirt. And then you'll see the elders are like lined up right at the entrance in seats with signs and everything. And then Japanese riot police are on the side. Some of them might be Uchinanshu, some of them are mostly Japanese, um, but are grabbing the elders one arm at a time, one leg at a time, taking them across the street, and then the elders come back, either lay on the ground right in the middle and perform die-ins, or they go sit back down at the entrance and it just happens over and over again every day. Uh -oh. So there is that symbolism of like taking our own land and using it to destroy our own ocean as well. Um, and since it's red, a lot of the elders said that it looks like our ocean is bleeding. If you can envision that, like the, the redness just going everywhere. So um, that's kind of what I saw when I first went and I just wanted to share that because I feel like it gives imagery to what's still happening right now. But um yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's a really powerful image. Um I, I think it's 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 also like as you're getting at a really good illustration of a case where a lot of the people who live closest to the to the ocean and who are deeply invested in it are trying to protect it and are being overridden by the Japanese government. And part of the controversy over the coral specifically also has to deal with um, the fact that the Japanese government is is trying to argue that they can they can still build the base there because they're going to transplant the coral colony. They're going to break it and transplant it elsewhere and will therefore save it. And it's been argued um, by marine biologists that this is not viable. It's not going to work. They're not going to save the coral colony. They're just going to kill it. Um, but the government is 
is still proceeding with this. And over the summer, um, the Okinawan governor, Denny Tamaki, who's very anti-base um, and who Kaya also interviewed in, in her documentary, yeah. um, rejected the permit that the government, the, the Japanese mainland government had applied for um, in order to, to transplant this coral because it's not viable. And just this past winter, the Japanese government just overrode his rejection and said, we're going to proceed with it anyway. And I think that's that's very um, indicative of how things have kind of proceeded, um, mm -hmm. where the local government has repeatedly said and, and civilians have repeatedly said, you can't do this. We're not going to let you. And they just kind of get steamrolled. <laughs> and while we're at it, Futenma is still open. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of emotions going through me right now. I mean, yeah. this, none of this information is like new. I mean, like maybe the statistics is, but it's still like just very difficult to take it in and be like, and still be like, this is okay because it's really not okay at all. Mm -hmm. And another point in terms of taking the land that is ours and um, putting it into the coral reefs, I think. Uh, Maya, you might be able to elaborate more on this, but um, they're using the soil in the areas during World War II where a lot of um, the bones have not been dug up again in terms of, I'm phrasing this horribly, <laughs> but basically the remnants of World War II, they're taking soil from that and using that as part of like the base of Hinoko. Um, I think Maya, you might be able to elaborate a little more elegantly than I can. Yeah. That. So this is, um, it's an area called Itoman where, uh, yeah, as you said, the, the bones of the dead from World War II, uh, basically because um, there was such widespread mass death, um, there are many places where there are human remains that were just not recovered um, because there was simply too much, I think, to collect. Mm. And, um, you know, as the the more time goes on, the more difficult it is to recover those remains. But of course, various um, aspects of Ryukyu and culture are are very invested in the the dead and the ancestors, and you know, um, maintaining shrines and graves. And um, there are, there are people who have been seeking out these bones on a volunteer basis, um, trying to recover them and. They're still finding more. And um, th there's this site um, where a man named uh, Takamatsu Gushiken, um, he leads a group of volunteers and they dig for bones and they had found some. And it's very close also to this peace monument that's supposed to honor the, de the war dead. And um, yeah, the Japanese government had decided they were going to to harvest dirt from this location in order to to supplement the landfill, in part, actually, because they were originally going to bring it from a part of mainland Japan. They were going to truck soil over and um, it was found to contain invasive species that would have been potentially very damaging to introduce into the, the Okinawan ecology. Um, so that plan was rejected and they said okay well we're going to find more dirt somewhere on Okinawa then and and this is this was what they came up with and it's it's uh indicative of the fact also that as Kaya was saying like because the seafloor is sinking they just need so much land that it's not it's not a regular i mean not that any landfill project is um, respectful to the earth, but like this one is especially egregious. It's really structurally like possibly not going to work ever at all. Um, and they're just going to kind of keep pouring and keep dumping. Um, they they say they're going to make these pillars out of compacted sand and drive them into the ground to literally reinforce the seafloor. And so I think part of what's what what blows my mind every time is that they're doing all of this destructive um, work right now. And it might not ever turn into a functioning military base, which maybe, you know, in an anti-war argument could actually be a good thing because, well, they, you know, that's one fewer military base, but also it, it just makes it seem so much more senseless. And also for the people who 
you know, as as Kaya was mentioning the sort of complicated um, local politics about the fact that Hinoko is a relatively poor area, there are people who are hoping the base will bring jobs um, and will will be kind of an economic boon. And if it's never completed, th- that opportunity for them, which is like kind of the only trade off, will never um, will never work out. One thing you were you were speaking to that kind of segues into my next question, and if we want to stay on Hanako further, I think we can absolutely do that. Um, but uh, Maya, you were speaking about sort of invasive species um, being trucked over, and I think about um, all of the different contexts in which unwanted things sort of you know sprout from like these military locations, not just in Okinawa, but um, across the world, wherever there's a military base, it seems to be like these little like little pools of what have you sort of seep out. Um, And one topic that had kind of been um, I've been noticing um, that we've all been noticing is COVID (laughs) and the pandemic and how military bases, uh, like when you have people that have to come in and out, of those spaces. Um, and when you introduce those naturally, what happens to the, the communities of people that are like on that land to begin with? So um, I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts about how, um, you know, pandemic um, as it relates to military bases, specifically in Okinawa, um, how that that has impacted the communities or what, what you've heard um, in that regard. Well, there's been there there's been pretty consistent reporting um these clusters of covid cases will emerge at at us military bases um and then sort of escape into the broader okinawan community um you know at first especially especially in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic the united states was doing so much worse a job than many other countries at at containment um and you know we can get into all kinds of reasons why but um it seemed to be partially uh and and to this day seems to be partially kind of a cultural act of negligence where you know people say like there are people who are anti-mask and people who just can't really wrap their heads around not having a gathering for the sake of preserving the health of the community um now and now it's happened repeatedly it happened around the 4th of July over the summer it happened uh after christmas and and new year's this year where there were big celebrations on the us bases and they had um an outbreak and then this and then then spread into the rest of the population of okinawa i don't want i don't want to make it um sound as if like you know, a virus has no nations. It, mm. it It's everywhere. It was going to be everywhere. I don't want to say it was singularly like only a, a U.S. military caused thing. But I also know that there have been these massive clusters that have um, that have erupted right after these big gatherings at at U.S. bases. And, um, you know, I, re- I remember actually when I was in Okinawa, um, it, it was uh, January 2020, oh, right wow. before. Yeah, <laughs> we, we didn't we didn't know what was coming. Um, Go back to that time, and it was it was very crazy. It it it, it felt like now in retrospect, it, it feels like a moment of foreboding. Um, because before we before we went to Okinawa, I went with my my grandmother who is um doing a lot of translation and also just like cult it, li- linguistic translation and also cultural translation. And we were in Tokyo before, before we went to Okinawa. Um, and I remember walking down the street with her and we walked past somebody who was wearing a mask. And she said to me very, very calmly, like it was the most normal thing in the world. Oh, here people often wear masks when they're sick, not because they're trying to stop themselves from getting sick, but because they're trying not to spread it, not not to spread whatever they have to other people. And I was like, yeah, okay, grandma, like I, I know, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> it, and I just sort of thought nothing of it. Um, and then, you know, a, a few months later, we we're here in the U S <laughs> seeing so many people um, refusing to wear masks and, you know, it, it continues to this day, this, 
really intense resistance to it. And I think, I don't know what the masking culture is like on U.S. military bases. And I don't want to jump to conclusions where I don't have any, like hard data, but it, it makes you wonder, mm. I guess I'll mm-hmm. say. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story of your grandmother. It's like, or, yeah, just to imagine <laughs> what it was like before pandemic and like that you can really go back to that moment yeah. with her. Um, I feel like being part of the Okinawan diaspora, like in America versus like actually being in Okinawan stuff is a little difficult to stay up to date with um, events like Hanoko and whatnot, um, just because of the language barrier and probably access to um, news and stuff. But how would you um, recommend people be able to stay informed and engage with like these events that are happening um, in Okinawa in general? I totally relate to that statement. Um, my family like are based in Oregon and uh, you know, the small amount of Uchinanshu people that are in Oregon does not help when you're trying to connect with what's mm-hmm. happening like completely across the world, right? So um, I would definitely say, I don't know. I think actually the first way that I found out, especially about like connecting with other mixed Uchinanshu and Shimanshu communities was actually through Hoi, like through the mm-hmm. really big organizations that are over here, um, especially for like English audiences it's easier to connect with like diaspora to Mm. understand like language barriers and stuff. Um, Personally, I think I have a different experience also because since I'm like, my mom is from Okinawa, I have like the direct like Mm -hmm. social media um, connection. Mm -hmm. So it might be different for me, but mostly I think it was through like connecting with other diaspora people um, either through social media, really on like, honestly, or through um, those kind of organizations that hold those talks and those spaces to talk together. Um, if you wanted to learn more about like Henoko and the base issue in general, though, I would definitely say like, one, you should totally contact your representatives to see what they know about it and see what they're going to do about it. But also, um, like, I'll, I'll guess I'll plug in my website here too. Yes. I tried to <laughs> I tried to put in as many news updates as I can, mostly in English articles. Um, I need to update it soon, but um, it's just rice for Henoko. Um, Henoko is H E N O K O. So there's like a news tab on there that I tried to update as much as possible. But honestly, the easiest way was doing my own quick research, like what's happening in Hinoko right now. And then seeing like Maya's article pops up and then <laughs> other things that give you those regular updates. Um, yeah. Sorry. I know it's not much to say because it's just, it sucks because there's not much out there as much as I would like there to be, um, which is one of the main reasons I made the documentary was like, I felt like a media blackout. Like, but like it's more now, there's a lot more now than there was like, 2019 Mm -hmm. but at the time it was only mostly local like okinawan news that were not able to translate it or that were like japanese national news but like very small segments so Mm -hmm. um i would say do the best research that you can knowing that there is not much out there but just staying connected with others who are interested in that talk is also just as important yeah i think those are all really good recommendations um I mean, this is when we're kind of lucky to live in the the age of social media. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's mo- it's mostly on the internet. I think the one other um, like logistical trick I would recommend to people if you really want to stay on top of uh, everything that comes out when it comes out is um, I use I use Google Alerts, which you can set up like through mm-hmm. Gmail and through Google. Um, it'll you basically set a search term and it will send you a daily email or it's daily if there's something every day, but it'll send you an email every time there's new stuff on the internet that gets published, um, that gets cataloged by Google with your, with your term. So I have one set for Okinawa. Um, and it basically, it's kind of like getting a newsletter every day. Um, Mm. but of course you have to be mindful of your sources because, you know, like like Kaya was saying, a lot of it's from Japanese national outlets. Um, you all, I also you'll get a lot from Stars and Stripes, so like military outlets. Mm-hmm. Um, you should always be thinking about like what's what the source is, what their what their bias might be. Um, 
how trustworthy it is, et cetera. Um, but if you can kind of use that, you you know, use your judgment and a, a critical lens, um, there's there's stuff out there and it'll keep coming. Yeah. yeah. Those are great suggestions. I never thought about using Google Alerts for for something yeah. like that, but I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. Yeah. Um, I kind of like a question that kind of popped up tangent from the ones that we have, but I think we've talked, uh, at least me and Mariko and Tori have talked about this on the side about how in the diaspora we might have, it seems like we might have a little more, or at least in America, a little more freedom to talk about these pressing issues in the military versus people who are living in Okinawa Honto because as Kaya was mentioning earlier, like you don't know what's not normal when you're living it every day. And so I guess it's like also how as a diaspora, we're able to support those living in Okinawa Honto right now while being respectful of what they want and knowing that we have maybe a little more um, freedom to be able to express our thoughts easily without repercussions of maybe not being able to get a job or um, things like that. But um, have you, both of you come up across um, that, that issue in terms of like when you're talking to people there and stuff like that? I mean, I could definitely attest that again, like from, from living in Oregon and then like, it is so, it was so hard to go back to Oregon after seeing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like after you see something like that, and you have to go home and then nobody's talking about it. Mm. Nobody cares. Like you, they don't even know what Okinawa is for a lot of people. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, like, first of all, this is messed up. Second of all, why don't you know? <laughs> and then what can we do? Like I'm across the world. Like what am I supposed to do in that situation? But, um, you know, I think something that I heard a lot from the students there was that honestly, the only for the people who have the means and the resources, if you can go and see the place yourself, and participate and see what's happening that's the first move is like just seeing what's going on or even just pictures on social media and everything find a way to connect to it personally um so that you can take it more seriously but also um one of the biggest points i heard especially from the elders too and like the people who are involved from different angles was that because this is a u.s military base it's like it's from the U.S. military standpoint, even though it's Japanese tax dollars being used. And so if the U.S. side doesn't want that base, they were not they will not make that base. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's because of the will from the U.S. government. And so if you are somebody who is in the U.S. for some like if you just happen to be a diaspora in the U.S. and you know that this issue is happening, but want to do something about it. Honestly, the first thing I would say is contacting your representatives. I know that sounds like really basic, but seriously, they are part of the direct affiliation with the will to have it be made. Um, the big message I got like every single day I was there was that like, if the US doesn't want it, they're not gonna make it. So mm -hmm. just tell everybody that they're like, they are just as much involved in this as we are. And we'll keep fighting from our end, but we need your support also. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say my, my website has a bunch of action ideas on it too. So if you want to go on there, um, even just simple sharing photos that like my brother and I took while we were there, other pictures of Henoko that you see, sharing articles like what Maya creates and what other people create. Um, just trying to create ways to make that conversation start from where you're at is, again, always important. You don't have to label yourself an activist to be able to, you know, cause a stir in what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. Like just a simple conversation with somebody else and having someone else feel just as like much of a need to be involved is, is it means the world to have other people know about this. Um, Again, with like how little information is out there on like in, in articles and records, that's why it's so important to have that like connection with those people and then taking action as well. But yeah, um, this is a U.S. military base. Therefore, like there is a need for people in the U.S. to help stop it as well. It's not just Okinawa issue. It's not just an American military issue. It's like environmental. It's everything. Honestly, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how I see it. Slay. <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I mean everything that Kaya said is is exactly right. Um it is 
it is a U.S. military base. And, and and there's so much for for people to do here. Um, I do think like the the notion that maybe people don't feel as as um, free to express themselves um, in opposition to the base. Uh, what like there there in Okinawa is is definitely a an important and interesting question. I think it's also Im- important to keep in mind that you know I don't I don't want to give the impression like right now on this podcast that everybody in Okinawa feels this way or that we know how, how, what everybody's attitude is towards the base. Right. Um, there's of course going to be like a, a vast range of, of local impressions. Um, and it actually, it reminded me, I thought it was really telling in Kaya's documentary. There's a college student who says, um, who's from Okinawa and says, since I started college, I've gotten to learn so much more about Okinawa you know, it, it just, it is so clear that like, there's so little information or there's tons of information, but so little of it being shared and such a range of perspectives. Um, yeah. I mean, I just think you should, you should meet people where they're at and like try to gauge their perspective and, um, you know, talk to them as much as you can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I'm uh, that actually I feel like we kind of just covered the next question, which was basically how do you stay optimistic in this sort of intense, heavy conversation, um, especially when it feels like like what can you do? Um, and so um, I, I feel excited and, and empowered by everything that you both have done, um, you know, whether it's through articles or documentaries or even the words that you've shared now. Um, but I would love to hear from you, um, you know, ways that you stay or remain optimistic, even in the like sort of the, the larger context of just how big this issue is. As you were saying, again, like it's it's hard to say optimistic sometimes, especially when you know like the trajectory of where it's supposed to go and the pushback, the really strong pushback by different parties. Um, the way I stay optimistic, I don't know. I kind of think about like my why, like why am I still trying to be a part of this, I guess. And that always relates to like, I love the ocean. I love Okinawa. I love my family there, you know, like just staying with like that love for it and then wanting to protect it. I think that just like refreshes it for me of kind of like, why are you doing this? No, I'm doing this because my family is there right now and they're experiencing this and I don't want them to experience this. Right. And then also like your own personal connections to it as like diaspora people of like, if there's something I could do about it, why shouldn't I do something about it? You know, but Mm -hmm. Even just a simple idea that like, you know what, I love Okinawa. I miss it so much. And I hope everybody there is doing good. But in the meantime, like for the future generations to have a world where you don't have to have military bases literally on both sides of you every single day. And you can go to your own beaches without it being private property and all those different things that like connect you so much more to a place that you love. That's that's kind of how I see it of like staying positive in the mindset that like, yes, this is very serious what's happening, but just remember, remember why. And then remember that other people are feeling the same way too. Um, I definitely do want to say like, as much as we were saying that it is a lot of elders that are out there, there are young people out there and it's starting to grow the amount of people. And I've started to connect with more people recently. So it's refreshing to see. And I just hope that like, it's that hope of like continuing to see the generations connecting together and then also just like we're all here because we love Okinawa and we want to protect it and if we can agree on that then we can agree on a lot of other things so it's kind of how I see it yeah that's a that's a good response this is a hard question um (laughs) because it is it is hard to stay optimistic um but I mean I think all those all those points that Kaya just offered are are very useful um and yeah, I mean I I think the way to stay optimistic is is just to know that like if we're just kind of wallowing in in sadness about bad things that are happening um whether it's in the context of of the Hinoko um construction or any other like terrible thing that's going on in the world um that's not going to do anything to stop it and um all we can do is our best kind of and like connect with with others who, who also care. Um, 
yeah, I think it's really helpful to to just like try to be in touch with other people who are also passionate about these topics. And like, it's a great way um, to like learn about your roots and your family. If, if for people who do have connections to Okinawa, as we all do. Um, yeah. Thank you for being pillars in our community, pushing that forward. Yeah. You know, this is, again, we're only scratching the surface of this, <laughs> of like these topics and stuff, but I'm glad we, we've had this conversation because again, it's like, as um, Maya, Maya, you're saying how um, I think the first, one of the first steps is to have meeting people where they're at and having those, t- these conversations, because without the conversations, we can't move anything forward. And so I'm hoping, yeah, this episode is just one of many conversations we'll have about about this because it's important. It's important to talk about these things. Kind of just to kind of lighten things up <laughs> again <laughs> and switching gears. What is your go-to karaoke song? Maya, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> okay. Um, I... <laughs> I'm I'm a pretty shy uh I'm pretty shy about singing and I I don't know that I have a, go, a single go to but I yeah. did um recently or I guess it was a couple months ago but you know somewhat recently do do karaoke with a a friend um who compelled me to do a thousand miles by Vanessa Carlton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. It was a good one. It was a good choice. <laughs> I love that. Nice. The piano that I love mm-hmm. in the video where she's like on the <laughs> piano. Does anybody like find it weird that the piano is just going? Hi. <laughs> 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 um, strangely, the only time I've actually done karaoke was when I would visit family in Okinawa. <laughs> yes. I had to choose Japanese and Okinawan songs. Um, so I guess my go-to you guys know like Kiseki is by The Green. It is a Japanese band. It's like so many people's go-to karaoke song. But in eighth grade, I had to do like the rap part and stuff like that with my <laughs> nice. Yeah. So Literally just ass. talking in Japanese. So me and my brother just go off on it together yeah, every time. That's nice. We wet it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Well, we're adding those two songs to the list to our karaoke <laughs> playlist. Oh, if you're adding it to the list, can we do Shimanshu no Takara instead? Because I like that one. <laughs> we can add both of them. We can add both okay. of them. <laughs> I love okay. that. Also, I really want to hear the rap part. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Hope that. No, no, you're good. <laughs> we'll have to do our own karaoke at some point. <laughs> yes. We keep plugging Taikai this year. I don't know if either <laughs> oh, yeah. plans are going, but yeah, manifesting that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, awesome. I think that kind of like concludes all the questions we had, but is there anything that we may have missed or any other things that you want to talk about in regards to activism work or the military bases that we, that you think it's important to talk about? Um, I would just say that if people are, get really interested in this issue um, and want to learn more, there are a couple of of really good books out there. Um, There is one, a a recent one by the writer Akemi Johnson is called um, Night in the American Village. And it's about like, it's a work of like narrative um, focused on, I think it's 12 women who all interact with the military bases in, in various ways. Um, and it's a really beautiful and an informative book. Um, there's a, also one that's a little bit older because um, Akemi's book only came out a couple of years ago, but there's one a little bit older called Okinawa in the U.S. Military by an anthropologist named Masamichi um, Inoue. And that also has a lot of just like very interesting context and history um, and and difficult questions. Thank you for sharing those resources. Uh, We'll definitely add those to our show notes. Yeah, Akemi, Akemi's book is amazing. Very difficult to read in terms of topic, but very informative. Cool. Anything else you want to share, Kaya? I don't think I have much to add. Um, I just wanted to say, (laughs) I just want to say thank you for like having this space for us. You know, Um, I think it's a very much needed conversation that doesn't always happen together, you know, like across, we're in completely different parts of the world and we're still able to talk to each other through this. So um, this is a very precious space. I appreciate what y'all are doing and I hope other people can relate to what we're talking about too. So, yeah. 
thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for yeah, having you. being on. Um, Seconded. Thank you for having us. Yeah. No, we appreciate this so much. Like I learned so much today too. Like I feel like I'm still learning a lot. And so to be able to talk to both of you is, is just like extra special because I know you both of you are very busy. And so thank you for taking the time out mm -hmm. to talk to us. Um, but where can we direct folks uh, in terms of looking to find out more information about what you do? Like feel free to plug in your uh, personal uh, social medias or any other channels. Um, Maya, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I'm on Twitter at Maya Hibbet, which is M-A-I-A-H-I-B-B-E-T-T. -T. Um, I'm also working on a, a story uh, for Lux Magazine, which is a, a relatively new socialist feminist magazine um, that should be out maybe by the time this episode airs, if not a little bit later, um, that's about the the anti-war movement in, in Okinawa and specifically kind of looking at the, the legacy of feminism um, in that movement. So that'll be uh, something to look out for. Awesome. And what about you, Kaya? Where can we find you? Awesome. Um, I think, so my Instagram for... Henoko Okinawa related stuff is just Kaya da Okinawa. Um, my name is K A I Y A, and then you know the other part. Um, you could probably find my personal Instagram at some point, but uh, <laughs> for the for the website again, it's um, rise for Henoko H E N O K O dot com. Um, those are my main things that I try to update, and I'll probably be updating them pretty soon, also. So, yeah, would love to stay in contact with anyone. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll have all of that information in the show notes again, but yeah, that could kind of concludes our podcast recording. And so thank you again for, for being on and sticking with us for this hour plus a little more than an hour. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. I love this conversation. <laughs> Matayasai. 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 <laughs>
Homeland, the land on which you were born, the land on which you live, the place your ancestors came from. Place is intrinsically tied to identity. So what do you know about the land that you live on? Today's fun fact is more of a mini session where we will learn one way to say a land acknowledgement in Uchinaguchi. Land acknowledgements are important, respectful statements made to honor indigenous peoples and their relationship to the land. And since many of us are not indigenous to the land we live on, it is even more important that we make these acknowledgements. To do this in Uchinaguchi, you will first need to know the name of the indigenous people who originally lived on the land and what that land was called in their language. For me, I live on land that was originally home to the Abenaki people. Second, you will want to know the indigenous name of the land that you live on. For me, I live in Vermont. The Abenaki name for this land is Nikina. So to say, I live on Abenaki land called Dekena, you would say Abenaki nu ji nu Dekena uti kura choibin. If you only know the name of the indigenous peoples, that's okay too. You can shorten the statement to say, I live on Abenaki land. In that case, it would be Abenaki nu ji uti kura choibin. And there you have it. Give it a go. We would love to hear what your land acknowledgement sounds like. You can send yours in to us on our website or tag us in a social post. A shout out to Brandon Ng Shin Shi for his help translating this acknowledgement. Nihei debiru. Thank you for sticking to the end, and we'll see you next episode. Mata yatai.